Chapter 38 The Feast of Unleavened Bread Exodus chapter 13 verses 3 to 7 And Moses said unto the people, Remember this day in which he came out from Egypt, out of the house of bondage, for by strength of hand the Lord brought you out from this place. There shall no leavened bread be eaten. This day came ye out in the month Abib. And it shall be when the Lord shall bring thee into the land of the Canaanites, and the Hittites, and the Amorites, and the Hevites, and the Jebusites, which he swear unto thy fathers to give thee, a land flowing with milk and honey, that thou shalt keep this service in this month. Seven days thou shalt eat unleavened bread, in the seventh day shall be a feast to the Lord. Unleavened bread shall be eaten seven days, and there shall no leavened bread be seen with thee, neither shall there be leaven seen with thee in all thy quarters. Exodus chapter 13 Verses 3 to 7. The Feast of Unleavened Bread is virtually identical with Passover, verse 6. No work was to be done during the seven days of the feast, verse 16. The unleavened bread commemorated the Exodus from Egypt, verse 17, and the Passover, the deliverance from the tenth plague, the death of the firstborn. These verses and more in Exodus 13 have been called repetitive. This is only superficially true. Things required previously in the emergency state in Egypt during the plagues are now set forth as part of the cycle of life. Gratitude, thanksgiving and joy must be basic to the life of godly man given the fact that he lives, moves and has his being in God's government, grace and mercy. There are thus two important requirements here, commemoration and rest. God requires us to commemorate and celebrate days important in our lives under him and as heirs of the grace of life. Never in the history of Christendom have they been fewer perhaps than now. Those that remain are highly secularised. The Christian calendar once governed society and the holy days were central to the calendar year in and year out. They also provided a great many days of rest. Productivity has not been enhanced by taking joy out of the calendar and joy has left as men have abandoned Christ. The unleavened bread is called the bread of affliction. Deuteronomy chapter 16 verse 3 because it recalls the affliction or bondage in Egypt and celebrates deliverance. It is therefore a joyful celebration. Israel had been delivered from bondage into service to the Lord, hence the sanctification of the firstborn. Exodus chapter 13 verses 1 and 2 precedes the law of unleavened bread because, having been under Egypt before, they are now under the Lord. This celebration was to take place in the month Abib, which means green ears of corn or wheat, because it was then that the wheat came into ear and things turned green all around them. The central biblical reference to Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread is in Exodus chapter 12 verse 1 to chapter 13 verse 16. The emphasis is on deliverance and joy in that fact. To understand this feast, it is necessary to understand the biblical meaning of leaven. Few words in scripture are more consistently misinterpreted. It is said by many to typify evil and sin. This is a serious misreading of the text. Two words are basically used in the Hebrew, chametz, kamates, and seor. The first means yeast cake, and the second yeast. If leaven means sin, why does God require leavened bread with the sacrifice of thanksgiving of peace offerings? Leviticus chapter 7 verse 13, 
Compare chapter 23, verse 17. Is sin an acceptable offering to God? It is true at times leaven has a negative usage, as in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 6 to 8, and Matthew chapter 16, verse 6, but it is used in these texts to typify a permeating influence and power. In Matthew chapter 13, verse 33, it is used in the same sense of a permeating power to describe the kingdom of God. It is a radical dishonesty of exegesis to insist, as Scophilians do, that in Matthew chapter 13, verse 33, it means evil. Another parable speak ye unto them. The kingdom of heaven is like unto leaven, which a woman took, and hid in three measures of meal, till the whole was leavened. Schofield's long comment on this verse rests on his presupposition that Leaven is invariably used in a bad sense. Interpreting the parable by these familiar symbols, it constitutes a warning that the true doctrine, given for the nourishment of the children of the kingdom, would be mingled with corrupt and corrupting false doctrine, and that officially by the apostate church itself. With such a method of interpretation, the Bible can be made to mean anything. If Schofield was right, Leviticus chapter 7 verse 13 means that God requires false doctrine of us. Schofield said of Leviticus chapter 7 verse 13, That's here. Leaven fitly signifies that, though having peace with God through the work of another, there is still evil in him. In this, he is closer to the truth. Leaven or yeast produces bread which can mould. A loaf of leavened bread is not an evil loaf, but it is a loaf which can grow mouldy. Our offerings to God, our works, are subject to mortality and decay. The passing of time dims or erases the works of men. This, contrary to Schofield, does not make them evil, our human labours for God's kingdom can be at times somewhat tainted with our vanity and sin, or they can be truly holy in a creaturely sense. In either case, they fade or pass away with the years. God, however, requires a leavened offering from us. All man's works, this side of heaven and the fullness of the new creation, are indeed mutable and limited, but our sanctification although a faulty process here on earth, is still a necessary one. Turning again to the Feast of Unleavened Bread, let us remember that the reference in Deuteronomy chapter 16 verse 3 is to the bread of affliction, and yet the feast is a joyous one. It is at this point that the meaning of this festival comes into focus. The Scottish Presbyterian divine, Thomas Boston, 1676 to 1732, in Human Nature in its Fourfold Estate, 1720, ridiculed the belief of the Arminians that man could go easily from a state of depravity into a state of grace without a shattering of his life. He wrote, And how is it that those who magnify the power of free will do not confirm their opinion before the world by an oracular demonstration in a practice as far above others in holiness as the opinion of their natural ability is above that of others? Or is it maintained only for the protection of lusts, which men may hold fast as long as they please, and when they have no more use for them, throw them off in a moment and leap out of a Delilah's lap into Abraham's bosom? What the Feast of Unleavened Bread tells us is that we eat the bread of affliction before we enter into the joy and power of our life in the Lord. There is another aspect to this festival. Almost all biblical holy days are food-related. As creatures, we require food to live. Modern man often forgets how basic food is because he takes it for granted. 
Some years ago, Thorold Rogers said of food that, even in the highest stages of civilization, all wealth can be ultimately resolved into the elementary form of food. The provision of food is the primitive form of labor. Its accumulation is the primitive form of wealth. Even more, we no longer are familiar with the meaning of breads because the bread we eat is no longer the staff of life. The religious meaning of bread is a very rich one. Our Lord declares, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. John chapter 6 verse 35 The unleavened bread of the feast points ahead to Jesus Christ, the bread from heaven, the bread of life. In much of Christendom, unleavened bread is used as one of the elements in communion. Thus, in the Christian Passover, the place of unleavened bread remains 